Good evening and welcome to our Waltham Public Library program, Rights and Wrongs, Black Women and the History of Voting. Um, this program is supported by a grant from the Waltham Cultural Council. My name is Deborah Hoffman and I organize programs and events for the library. Thanks for tuning in. Before we start, I want to let you know how the evening will go. Our speaker will do her presentation um, probably around 35, 40 minutes, and then she'll field questions. To ask questions via the chat function, use a Google account to sign into YouTube. Feel free to write your questions at any time, and then I'll read them at the end of the presentation. We are so pleased to once again host um, Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson. Um, she is an historian and assistant professor in the Africana Studies Department at Wellesley College. Take it away, Kelly, and thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am, before we get uh, deep, I'm gonna to start to share my screen so at least it will be up and ready. Okay, so uh, first I just wanna say thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to speak at the Waltham Public Library and uh, to have a format like this, it, at first it's kind of disappointing because I love interacting with people, but in other ways it's really great because you can reach even more people online uh, than face-to-face. -face. And so there, there've been some pros and cons with Zoom, but um, I'm finding that there's a lot of benefit in being able to connect with people that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do beforehand. So there's that. So thank you so much for being here. This is the perfect time to talk about voting rights and uh, the history of suffrage in this country and women and Black women. Um, we are just really living through, I know this word has been overused in all of 2020, but unprecedented times. <laughs> that word unprecedented, I feel like it's popped up everywhere. But um, when you think about the fact that the vice presidential uh, Democratic nominee is uh, Kamala Harris and is a Black woman, uh, when you think about the fact that this is the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote, um, and that we're at this, you know, really pivotal election, um, these are, you know, exciting times, disturbing times, but nevertheless, these are times that are uh, ripe with conversation and debate and history. And so I really want to take, you know, uh, the amount of time that I have to try to give you as much possible history as I can. Um, so we're going to cover a lot of ground um, and I'm going to try to go through it in a way that still feels thorough though. So let me get my next slide together here. Done. Okay, so I want to cover five points today. I want to briefly touch on the history of the 15th Amendment because I think that's really helpful for giving us an understanding of how we think about gender and race in the vote. I want you to I want to talk about voter suppression because I also think that's a big part of understanding who got to vote and who didn't get to vote. And then specifically diving into women and the vote and uh, 1920 and what happens. Um, and then we'll fast forward a little bit more to the contemporary moment looking at the Voting Rights Act. And then we will look at voting uh, today to wrap up. So first I use this analogy in almost every talk I give, which is the tree, tree, forest, tree, 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 forest metaphor, which is when I was in college, I went to what was the National Redwood Forest in California. It was beautiful. And I never forgot that experience. Um, but it's interesting. I couldn't tell you what the oldest tree was or what the tallest tree was or what, you know, sort of like the widest tree or anything like that. But I never forgot the experience. I never forgot that moment. I never forgot the forest. And so I kind of want you to do that today. I'm gonna throw a lot of information at your way. And I don't want you to necessarily remember the tallest tree, the oldest tree, the youngest tree, but I just want you to remember the, the forest. I want you to think about the larger messages that I want to convey with women's history and with voting rights and what's so important. I want you to have sort of the takeaways of that moment. Um, so I'm going to give you a lot of names 
don't feel like you need to memorize them. But if there's someone that piques your interest, I absolutely encourage you to di uh, dig deeper and investigate that person um, because you could literally give an entire lecture on just one person that I mentioned today, like Ida B. Wells or Sojourner Treat. That's they're an entire lecture, but we can't cover that today. So today is the forest. That's what I'm going to give you. Um, so. Boating is everything. Um, that's also really important. I'm going to call that the moral of today's lesson. Voting is everything. Voting controls not just, you know, political contests, but legal statutes, our rights, our social interactions, our access. Uh, education is a huge part of that. We want to vote based on what we know. Uh, it frames our citizenship. So I think we can really call ourselves, you know, citizens of America when we can enact our ability to vote and be an informed, educated, and voter. Uh, voter. But I also think in terms of like foreign relations, it's so important. Not all countries in France franchise their citizenships. Not all people are allowed to vote. Um, and even in America, we still have certain restrictions on who can vote. There are age restrictions, there are criminal restrictions. Um, but voting is so important and really does occupy so much space in our life. I think more space than we probably um, understand on a daily basis. So if you want to know more about women and voting, particularly Black women in voting and the suffrage movement, there's so many books I could give you. So I like to give sort of like a, a screenshot of just like some of the top books that I think are really compelling. The biggest book on my right, your left is Vanguard. It just came out this month. I highly recommend getting it. It's from the award-winning author, Martha Jones. She does a fantastic job of talking about how black women, you know, broke barriers and insisted on equality for all. Um, and I think this book is really gonna change the field in a lot of ways in terms of how we understand not just the impact of women in the vote, but how Black women were central to that movement. I really love One Person No Vote uh, by Carol Anderson. It really talks about voter suppression and how voter suppression works. But then there are just some classics and like biographies that are good. So To Tell the Truth Freely by um, about Ida B. Wells or The Life of Mary Church Terrell or The Myth of Seneca Falls. Uh, Rosalind Turborg Penn has a great book that's like an oldie but a goodie. I use it in my classrooms a lot, African-American Woman in the Struggle for the Vote. Um, and then there's Fighting Chance, you know, Faye Dundon's um, The Struggle for Women's Suffrage and Black Suffrage. We're gonna talk about that uh, in the next few slides. So, I think intersectionality is really important before we get into anything. And for those of you who don't know what intersectionality is, it is coined by Kimberly Crenshaw out at UCLA and is the idea that we have multiple identities. So I'm not just a woman, I'm a black woman. Um, or maybe, you know, you might not just be a man, but also a gay man or a disabled man. We all have multiple identities. But oftentimes when we frame political questions, there's this tendency to think of race solely in terms of black men and women solely in terms of their whiteness. There's a really good book called All the Men Are Black and All the Women Are White. And then it's a semicolon, but some of us are brave. And it talks about this um, dual identity that Black women occupy as being Black and women, and how oftentimes their narratives, their voices are left out of the struggle when we discuss race or when we discuss womanhood. Um, so one of the things I ask my students is kind of an obvious question given the year that we're celebrating the women's right to vote, the 100th anniversary, but I'll ask them, you know, when were given women given the right to vote? And they will say 1920. And I'm like, absolutely good, correct. Now, when were Black women given the right to vote? And they're like, uh. And so I talked to them about 1965 because until the Voting Rights Act, if you were a Black woman and you were living in the South, chances are you would not be able to vote. And so what's important to me is not just talking about political enfranchisement for some, but political enfranchisement for all. When, when everyone is included, that's when these laws really start to matter. So when we talk about the history of the 15th Amendment, this is the first moment in history in which 
the ability to be able to vote becomes racialized. So if we think about the end of the Civil War and the start of Reconstruction, you have the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery, the 14th Amendment, which basically grants citizenship um, to more, most importantly, former um, slaves. And then you think about the 15th Amendment, which is really crucial. It guaranteed that no American would be denied the right to vote based on race, not sex, that's really important, but race. Matter of fact, you can look at the actual Article 15 in the Constitution, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. This means you could be a free man or a former slave and you would still have the ability to be able to vote, which is really important. So when we think about this moment, Reconstruction, this is the only period or the only moment, dare I say, in the Western Hemisphere where you have Black people going from enslavement to enfranchisement, political enfranchisement, in a very short amount of time. Within the, the moment that the 15th Amendment is ratified, free Black men are voting in South Carolina. And it's so interesting to me because not only are they voting, but they're being elected to office. You get your first Black senators during this moment, your first Black congressmen. Um, I think it's really important to note that even though Black people are voting, they are not, they don't have full Black power or Black supremacy. They're not controlling outcomes, but they have influence, which is really important, political influence for the first time ever. So when we think about what that political influence is able to do, especially in, you know, during this moment of reconstruction, I, I like to use this quote a lot from Thomas Miller of South Carolina. He's talking about the eight years that they were in power. Really, he's talking about these eight political years of reconstruction in which Black people were enfranchised for the first time in this political revolution that takes place. And he says, we were eight years in power. We built schoolhouses, established charitable institutions, built and maintained the penitentiary systems, provided for the education of the deaf and dumb, rebuilt ferries. In short, we had reconstructed the states and placed it upon the road to prosperity. And then W.E.B. Du Bois, famous scholar, historian, sociologist Du Bois says, if there was one thing that South Carolina feared more than bad Negro government, it was good Negro government. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that that quote was so powerful because, you know, if they had elected black officials or black men were able to vote and there was corruption, then they could say, see, we told you those black people were inferior. We told you they weren't worthy of the ballot. But when black people came into power and they did all of these wonderful progressive changes like schoolhouses and hospitals and educational facilities, um, it defied the white supremacy myth. And it showed that yes, black people were capable of being citizens and exceptional citizens at that. And so as a result of this progress, you see the end of reconstruction, what happens after black men are given the vote? Well, some good things do happen, which is another lecture on reconstruction. <laughs> but you also start to see the rise of the KKK for the first time. You get race riots that break out all over the country. Grant, President Grant has to come in and bring federal troops to suppress the Klan in 1872. You have the radical Republicans who are now starting to die away. People like Charles Sumner um, dies in 1875. A lot of the, you know, the major um, political uh, uh, Republicans that were responsible for putting forth a lot of this very progressive legislation are now dying away. And the North starts to turn its back on civil rights in an attempt to just get the country back on its feet again. Um, so when the 15th Amendment comes in, one of the things it also does is it fractures uh, gendered franchise into the Constitution. So people who would have been allies with the Republicans and with the former abolitionists, people like Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison and Charles Sumner and Daddy Stevens, their white women allies are now completely distraught because they realize that in giving black men the vote, they themselves were denied the opportunity to vote. And white women thought especially, well, if we're, if we're ever gonna get a chance to vote, surely we should come before black men. That was not the case. And so you had this great alliance that was um, really 
cultivated during the abolitionist movement and all throughout the Civil War and during Reconstruction that gets severed because of you know these uh, this response to the 15th Amendment. So I think it's interesting that when we talk about people like Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, which were really, really close with uh, someone like Frederick Douglass, when Black men get in the road, everything changes. So Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton say, wow, this 15th Amendment, we need to shift our tactics. And so Stanton starts to appeal to a democratic politician base to affirm the beliefs in Black inferiority and to really push this idea of, no, Black men should not have been given the right to vote. Black men are inferior. And not just Black men, but really all people are inferior to white people. And she says in 1868, this is in her editorial newspaper, The Revolution, she says, think of Patrick and Sambo and Hans and Young Tung, who do not know the difference between a monarchy and a republic, who never read the Declaration of Independence or Weber Spelling, uh, or Weber Spelling Book, making laws for Lydia Marie Childs and Lucretia Mott or Fanny Kimball? And then she goes on to talk about how immigrants and Black people were uneducated and unqualified to vote, while white women of a certain class and privilege were qualified. And this is really important because even Susan B. Anthony is not really talking about the empowerment of all white women, just educated white women, just privileged white women that are that have literacy, that have you know some sort of letters behind their name. Those are the ones that should be granted the right to vote, certainly before uneducated black men or really any black man for that matter. And so the 15th Amendment not just doesn't just become you know racialized, it also becomes gendered in the way that people are responding to it. So one of the two things that happens after this moment of reconstruction ends is that white feminist anger we see is long lasting, that it lasted long beyond black political power. Black political power has a short moment, a short window in which you see black senators or black congressmen or black elected officials. But once reconstruction ends, it sort of closes the door on any opportunity for black people to be able to affect change for all people. And the resentment, the racial resentment that white women have gets perpetuated alongside white supremacy from the late 19th century to the early 20th century, and in some ways, even to this day. We'll get to that. So Du Bois says something that's really powerful. He says at the end of Reconstruction, the slave went free and stood for a moment in the sun, then moved back again towards slavery. And when we think about the end of Reconstruction, this is really the Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson, that basically says that separate and equal is constitutional and makes segregation the law of the land, but it also allows for things that would have been deemed maybe unconstitutional before, now legal. Now you can use race as a form, as a legal form to be able to keep black people out politically. Now you can't do it in terms of you know, uh, explicitly saying Black people can't vote, but you can create language that effectively disenfranchises Black people. And this is what happens with the end of Reconstruction and what is known as voter suppression. So voter suppression had a lot of different tactics. Again, you can't say Black people can't vote, but if you institute a grandfather clause and you say, well, if your grandfather didn't vote, then you can't vote. And if you were a formerly enslaved person, of course your grandfather did not vote. So it was a way to completely keep Black men from the ballot box. If you institute a poll tax, knowing that most Black people do not have a significant amount of money, you can effectively keep people from the polls. Literacy tests, knowing that educational was difficult to come by. Understanding clauses, they would have these really convoluted tests that were hard to pass. Good character clauses, if I saw you drinking alcohol, then maybe you're not fit to vote. And then, of course, one party primaries, which were all white and did not allow for any inclusion or diversity in which for if you could select a uh, um, someone to represent you on your behalf politically. Intimidation and violence are also there as well. So let's say maybe your grandfather did vote. Maybe you can pay the poll tax. But if I show you my pistol and say, you sure you want to vote? Then that would also keep you away from the ballot box. 
Um, I think some of these statistics are really interesting because they don't just shape the way that we see, you know, women's suffrage, but Black women's suffrage in particular um, is something that all of these laws were in effect up until you get the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So voter turnout in the Black community peaks. It's at 79%. It's almost 80% in 1896. And then right after that, voting turnout plummets. You have less than 15% of people voting in the early 20th century. In Louisiana, to give you a more specific um, example, 130,000 Black people are voting in 1896. By 1904, just 1,300 people are voting. That is, I mean, just mind-blowing, 130,000 people. And within 10 years, um, you've got 1,300. My question is, who are the 1,300, right? Like, that's what I want to know. Who was able to vote in the in the midst of that? Um, a lot of these statistics come from Carol Anderson's book, so it's really helpful if you want to know more about these um this, this data, her book would be great to reference. Um, in Alabama, peak voting was at 180,000 before um, Reconstruction ended. It plummets to just 3,000 people. And by 1940, this is 25 years, um, no, sorry, uh, yeah, 25 years before the Voting Rights Act, only 3% of eligible Black people, men or women, were registered to vote in the South, just 3%. Um, so it shows you how effective voter suppression was. So even though white women are lambasting black men in their ability to be able to vote in a short amount of time, all of that is stripped away. Um, so there's a couple more statistics I want to show you. Uh, by 1953 in the Deep South, uh, um, 11 counties where the black population equaled or exceeded that of the whites had only 1.3% of all eligible black voters uh, were able to vote, 1.3%. In two counties, there were no African-American voters at all. And you have to remember the deep South is where the bulk of the black population is. So yes, there are black people in the North, but the numbers are not nearly the same. Um, this is an example of a literacy test. And listen, y'all, I have a PhD and some of these questions, I was like, what? So, you know, number one, draw a line around the number or letter in this sentence, draw a line under the last word in this line, cross out the longest word in this line. Uh, number six, in the space below, draw three circles, one inside engulfed by the other, make the letter X above a small cross. Like these things are meant to be um, confusing and complicated. And then here's the real kicker. Uh, it says, be careful, one wrong answer denotes a failure of test. And also you've got 10 minutes to complete it, right? So you were given, you know, even if you tried to study for this test, um, you know, it still might be difficult to do it in the amount of time that you were allotted. Some tests were ridiculous. So this one, the registrar's office in Mississippi would say, how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? How many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? Like that is absurd, absurd. And they knew this. They knew that these were easy ways to disenfranchise black men and women and keep them from being able to obtain uh, the vote. But this one, I think the poll tax, which is, it's not just something that hurts, you know, black people, but also hurts poor white people, um, that this rule was, um, was interesting and in that there were backwards rules about when or where to pay the poll tax. So it was never clear about where to go. Some sheriffs required that you had to go and registered with him personally. Like what black person is gonna knock on the sheriff's door? It's not gonna happen. The tax, secondly, was also cumulative. So every year a voter was eligible, the tax was due. So if you didn't vote for, say, 20 years in Alabama in 1944, then you wouldn't need to just pay $1.50. You would need to pay $30. And $30 may not seem like a lot now, but that's the equivalent of $722 in 2016. So let me ask you this before I give you the, the last statistic. Uh, how much would you pay to vote? If it cost you $50, would you vote? If it cost you $100, would you vote? If it cost you $1,000, would you vote? Like for most of us, if it cost $10, we're like, no, no, I wouldn't vote. Um, you know, it does not require that much money to take away the incentive of someone to use their political um, enfranchisement. 
So in Mississippi, an average farm family's income was less than $100 a year. So if you're making less than $100 a year, there's no way you're paying $30 of your income toward a vote, right? Toward something that won't grant you a job, won't grant you education, won't grant you you know, a mortgage or anything like that. There was no financial incentive or benefit to voting. So uh, uh, I think this is a really good quote by Trevor Gervais. And he says, we are only as strong as our most suppressive state. We are only as strong as our most oppressive state. So when Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia are up to all these shenanigans, that that's the strength of us, right? Like that's that's the, for better or worse, the best and worst of the United States, um, because that's the bar, right? The bar is not how millionaires are treated. The bar is how are the least of us treated? How are the poorest of us treated? That is how we should measure a society. So point number three, women in the vote. So now we've seen how black men get the vote. We see how black men lose the vote, black men and, and white and black women for that matter. Uh, but white women are still advocating for their enfranchisement. And in a lot of ways, you know, this is incredibly hard work. I don't want to take away at all from the struggle that many white women and black women were doing at this time to bring about their own political enfranchisement. It's incredibly important. But I also want us to understand that this moment is also fraught and that is rife with hypocrisy and rife with racism and sexism and classism and that those things need to be teased out. We need to be willing to have those difficult conversations and to not, no pun intended, but whitewash <laughs> American history. So when we think about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susie B. Anthony, these are the first two names that come to our mind because they are seen as the leaders, the great champions of the suffrage uh, movement. But I think that we can talk about them and we can talk about their contributions, which I think are significant, but we cannot dismiss the fact that they were adamant about not including black women or about protecting black men's um, already achieved right to vote. So Elizabeth Cady Bay Stanton's biographer, Lauren Ginsburg, put it this way. Uh, she said nearly, she was nearly singular. This is Elizabeth Cady Stanton in her openly racist defense of women's suffrage. Stanton and Anthony labored only for the rights of white women only for the rights of white women. Now they get challenged by other black women suffragists like you know, Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, but it did not matter. They only cared about white women's right to vote. Um, this is a quote from Susan B. Anthony. And these are, you know, these are difficult quotes, but she says, I will cut off my right arm of mine before I will ever work for or demand the ballot for the Negro. And this is someone who not only was friends with Frederick Douglass, but Frederick Douglass's daughter, Rosetta, you know, she called her like Auntie Susan, like she loved and looked up to Susan B. Anthony. They were very close. But when the 15th Amendment came, though, all of those relationships effectively get cut off. Um, there are other instances in which you see, you know, these pictures of, of white women and they're all at the table pushing for the vote, but it's always important to ask not just who's at the table, but who's not at the table, who's not being included in this moment right now. And first of all, <laughs> who's also doing the heavy lifting and work to make sure that the vote happens. So I want to introduce you to some of these um, women. First of all, I like to start with Sojourner B. Truth because I think that if you were to look at the suffragist movement, you wouldn't start with Elizabeth um, Cady Stanton or Susan B. Anthony. You would actually start with Sojourner Truth. In 1850, Sojourner Truth appears at the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts. That's not far from where I live. Um, and during this year, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was at home. Susan B. Anthony was like absent, nowhere to be found. And yet, you know, we credit these women as sort of the pioneers of it, but it's Sojourner Truth that gave that powerful speech. Aren't I a woman? It's Sojourner Truth that stands for the vision of women's rights and the fight against racism and equality and suffrage simultaneously. So, uh, Sojourner Truth is basically saying these things aren't mutually exclusive. We're not just fighting for, you know, women's rights or emancipation. We're fighting for women's rights and emancipation and equality, that all of these things go hand in hand. 
So when she gives her, you know, aren't I a woman speech, she gives another speech in 1851 at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. Sojourner Truth delivers what is really one of the most, I would say, uh, powerful feminist speeches and earliest feminist speeches that we know of in the 19th century. And that is the aren't I a woman or ain't I a woman speech. And she talks about like what it means to be an enslaved woman, what it means to have what Kimberly Crenshaw calls intersectionality, this duality of yes, I am black. Yes, I was a former slave, but I am also a woman. I am also a mother. I have given birth to children. Um, and it's interesting because in 1872, Tooth tries to vote. She tries to vote in Michigan and she gets turned away in Battle Creek at the, at the presidential um, election. Even though after emancipation, she spends the rest of her career pushing for women's suffrage. Um, Harriet Tubman is another woman. I think we know Harriet Tubman is an abolitionist, but the latter half of her career, she's she's working as a suffrage a suffragist. She is working on behalf of women's rights. Um, I love Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She is great in 1866, just a couple years or a year after the Civil War, she gives a speech before an audience of white women talking about rights and wrongs. And this is where I get the title of the lecture. She says, you white women speak of rights, but I speak of wrongs. You speak of rights, but I speak of wrongs. And what she's talking about is this double standard, this duality that when black women try to speak, when black women try to have a platform, when black women try to work with white women allies, they are shunned, they are dismissed, they are not allowed to enter the space. Um, and she talks about what it means to be a black woman, to be married to a black man, to have a black son, how she is constantly fearful about how she is being treated, and that these are things that are not being discussed, and that these issues of black rights are also an issue of black women's rights, and they have to be seen um, simultaneously, that they are connected. So let's not talk about rights, let's talk about wrongs. Uh, Coralie Franklin Cook, another great, you know, pioneer of the suffragist movement. Not too many people know about her, but she founded the National Association of Colored Women, and she was a committed, hardcore suffrage. I love this picture of her, too, because she's like draped in fur and looks fantastic and has got like the little swoop of the hair. She's fabulous. Um, but in 1915, she published Votes for Mothers. And in the NAACP magazine, The Crisis, she talks about the challenges of being a mother and why women need the right to vote. This is 1915. And so when we think about these women who have been silenced, you know, I don't know, I wish we could do a show of hands, like how many know of Coraline Franklin Cook? Um, um, but her contribution and her, um, you know, scholarship in this moment is so critical and so important because once again, it's also talking about multiple identities, what it means to be a Black woman and a mother, and why Black mothers need the right to vote and to advocate for themselves politically. Another one is uh, Juno Frankie Pierce. Juno Frankie Pierce is also a major suffragist. She gets invited in May of 1920 to speak at a state convention in Tennessee. And this is what she says. She says, what will the Negro women do with the vote? We are asking only one thing, a square deal. We want recognition in all forms of this government. Recognition in all all forms of this government. Like, don't leave it up to our husbands. Just be equal, just be fair. Like, you want to give the right to women to vote? Then include all women in that. Like, don't just make it about white women, make it about all women. This is, again, 1920. This is Maddie E. Coleman. Maddie Coleman's an African-American physician, a leading feminist and a huge proponent of the color Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, Coleman's among Tennessee's most active suffragists. Um, and together, you know, Coleman and other black women in the state helped to get 2,500 black women to vote in 1919 in Nashville municipal elections. That's huge, because last I checked, Nashville's in the South, right? <laughs> like, Nashville's in the South. And so the, the fact that they are mobilizing black women to be able to vote in, which is very much a Southern state, is huge. And they do vote. They were the first, um, the city's first election 
election uh, in which Black women were able to vote was in 1920. And so it's because of their activism that there are pockets, very small pockets, but there are pockets where Black women in the South are able to vote prior to the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And that, to me, is miraculous because we know the challenges that went along with voter suppression. And when I think about Ida B. Wells, I can't talk about the suffragist movement in the 20th century without talking about Ida B. Wells. Her contributions are, you know, just off the charts and, and I think in a lot of ways underrepresented within the public um, memory. I think part of this is because we know Ida B. Wells, if you know her, of uh, a journalist. You know, she was also a member of the NAACP. She wrote about anti-lynching legislation. And oftentimes we see her as a race leader, but we don't necessarily see her as a womanist, as someone who's pushing, you know, gender uh, policies and women suffrages, but she absolutely was. She worked with white women suffrages and she founded the Alpha Suffrage Club. This is the first group for black women. And they would canvas the neighborhoods, they would educate people on causes so that they would be informed voters. She helped to get some of Chicago's Black elected officials positions. The first Black alderman was because Ida B. Wells helped to push for him to get this uh, role. And in 1913, Wells and other activists from Illinois have a delegation that travels all the way to Washington, D.C. to participate in the historic suffrage parade. And we've probably all seen pictures of this parade where you see women that are all decked out in white and there's you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of white women and black women, you don't see them in the pictures, but they are there voting and, and pushing, or not voting, but pushing for the right to vote. Um, and when Ida B. Wells, shows up, I think she does something quite miraculous that at this particular march, this is a great picture, I think of the image of the march. We've seen some of these images before, I think because of the 100th anniversary, a lot of like sort of photography is circulated about this significant march. Um, and it's been compared to other women's, women's marches as well. But you know, because the pictures are in black and white and because it's hard to see, we assume that most of the people there are white and that the leadership is definitely white. Um, you see this as well. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people in Washington, DC to push uh, the suffrage march. But what I think is a interesting aspect about this moment is the racism in which Black women were literally pushed to the back of the line. They told Black women, we're going to let you march, but you can't march with white women and you really need to be the back of the line. Like they said that. And, you know, this is where you have every branch, every voting club has shown up to the nation's capital to, to march and then to get all the way to Washington, D.C. to be told you have to march in the back, that we're segregating this march, uh, was absurd. And so there are a lot of Black women that said, no, we're not going to take this. We're not going to allow you to sideline us. We're not going to allow you to silence our voices. And so when I think about the fact that Black suffragists initially rejected the event, they're like, Psha! heck with this, we're not doing this. <laughs> but Wells, Ida B. Wells and other suffragists um, like uh, Stanton actually wrote letters asking the parade to allow black women to participate. And eventually the leaders acquiesced, but they still said, you know, we want you at the back of the line. And black women said, no, we're not going to do that because there were a lot of black white women that did not want black women there. They thought they would ruin their chances if we saw black women there. You know, white men will get upset. It's hard enough pushing for white women. It's going to be even harder if black women are by our side, uh, which doesn't make much sense, but it does if you think like a white supremacist. So, and a lot of white people at that time did. They thought that Black suffragists would make it worse for them. So there are Black women that participate. Wells, however, refuses to march at the back of the line. And this is a picture of Ida B. Wells marching with her Illinois delegation, her all Black women's Illinois delegation, which the picture is not great. The quality is not great, but I still... Um, 
I still appreciate it because you get to see some of the signs. You know, it says vote, no tax, like end the poll tax. Um, you see the signs or the banners of Illinois representing their state, representing where they're from. Um, and to me, this, it just goes to show that like in all of these social movements from the abolitionist movement, you know, the suffrage movement, uh, you look at the contemporary women's movement, black women are there. And oftentimes they're at the forefront of it. So when I think about Alice Paul, this is a white participant, she said, quote, as far as I can see, we must have a white procession or a Negro procession or no procession at all. No procession at all. Like there is no way we are going to be integrated. But despite all of this, the 22 founders of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, um, an African-American women's sorority, were the only African-Americans women organization to participate. This is a picture of them there as well. Um, and they were founded in 1913 at my alma mater, Howard University. I love representing my school. <laughs> um, but they contributed to this march as well. And this was their first public act as a sorority. They said, the first thing we're going to do is march in the women's parade and advocate for the right for women, all women, to be able to vote. Whether they will have us or not, we will be there. Um, and I like the fact that, you know, when you think about what Black women are up against, they're not asking for permission. They're not asking, you know, to, to be included. They're demanding to be included. They're requiring their contributions and their um, commitment to suffrage be put right alongside women's commitment to getting the right to vote. So I can't, I know for, for time purposes, how are we on time? Oh gosh, it's already like 7.41. Uh, I cannot get to everyone who participated, particularly when it comes to African-American women, but I just wanna highlight a few women. Sojourner Truth, we've talked about Mary Ann Shad Carey. She's the first black woman to start a newspaper and become the editor of her newspaper. You know, Harriet Purvis, Frances E. Watkins Harper, um, you know, Anna Julia Cooper, Josephine Pierre St. Muffin. A lot of these women were either wives of prominent abolitionists or prominent NAACP members, um, but they are forces in their own right. They really don't need their husbands. They are able to take on leadership roles in remarkable ways, and their stories are and their biographies are worthy of their own individual lecture. But I wanted to pinpoint out some women for lack of time because I, I want to be able to get to questions. But I want to cover a few more things. This is my problem. I always put in too much information. Uh, so I'm going to fly through the Voting Rights Act and just talk about the fact that because of the Voting Rights Act, this is the first time in which not just Black women, but all women, really all people are able to vote and get enfranchisement for the first time. It does away with the poll tax. It does away with the grandfather tax. It does away with all things that were meant to suppress the vote and keep people from being able to vote. It even um, keeps people who may not speak English, it allows them a ballot as well, a ballot in their native language. So, you know, when I lived in Dorchester, um, not too long ago, I remember going to vote and they said, do you want a ballot in Vietnamese? Do you want a ballot in Spanish? Or do you want a ballot in English? And I was like, wow, this is so great. Like you could speak Vietnamese and vote in America. If you're a citizen, you can vote. Like English is not required. So there's so many victories that come out of, you know, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. But a huge part of that is that for the first time, Black women are able to join their fellow sisters in this moment moment. Um, so I talk about, you know, we don't have time, but Fannie Lou Hamer is a suffragist in her own right, pushing for the advocacy of Black people to vote in the South. Um, I think about Bloody Sunday, we think about the violence that incurs just for Black people trying to get the right to vote. You know, this was a violent endeavor. You could put your life at risk trying to secure political power. And this is not political power like political supremacy. This is just a little bit of political influence, right? A little bit of an opportunity to have a say in who your um, elected official is. So we all have seen the images from Bloody Sunday and we know what happens in Selma, Alabama. And right after this, we get the Voting Rights Act. But even in this, I want you, I showed this picture because this is a woman who's been beaten by the cops. But 
Black women were not spared from violence, right? Black women were not spared from violence. When it came to the vote, Black men and Black women were just as, as susceptible to police brutality as anyone else. Even Black children, we've seen this with the bombing of, um, you know, the church in Alabama and the killing of the four little girls, like even children were susceptible uh, to violence. And you see that in this images here, there's a woman who's, you know, down on the ground, who's been um, clocked by the police. You see a child. I mean, how old is this kid? A child that is tussling with the police um, all to really get people's attention to understand how important the right to vote is. So uh, August 6, 1965, the vote takes place place. Uh, and then, you know, voting today, I'll take a couple minutes, two minutes just to get to this. Um, voting today is still largely contested. Voter suppression is still ongoing. And I want us to be able to celebrate these moments. You know, I want us to be able to say, yes, the 100th anniversary of, you know, the women's right to vote. And yes, the Voting Rights Act. But we have to be careful because Martin Luther King says, you know, when we think about change, it doesn't roll in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through constant struggle. This is MLK's quote, but uh, he says, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through constant struggle. And I think that we have to acknowledge that the women's right to vote was not inevitable. The Voting Rights Act was not inevitable. The end of slavery is not inevitable. It comes through constant struggle. And that struggle continues to this day. Uh, we see this is 2017. This is the Women's March, uh, which I think is really important to highlight, you know, the response to a Trump election uh, and the galvanizing of women. But I also think it's important because we think these issues of, of racism have passed us and they have not. You know, scholars said that Trump's election was because 52% of women voted for him. And a lot of black women were skeptical of this woman's march because they basically said, yeah, I didn't do this. I didn't put him in office. Like, you're mad about this. Um, and I love this picture because it has the black woman with the sucker saying, don't forget, white women voted for Trump. And so it's this idea that the supremacy, the white supremacy of the 19th century and 20th century is still with us to this day day, and it helps someone like Trump get elected. Um, so I'm going to fly through this. I don't have time for this. Oh, gosh, I want to leave time for questions. This, this is really good. I'll just say this. I highly recommend um, Stephanie Jones Rogers book, They Were Her Property. It may seem unrelated to the topic uh, that we're talking today, but it's so important because she talks about the fact that white women do have power. White women have always had power. It might not have come in the form of a vote, but it definitely wielded political, social, and economic outcomes. And so she talks about the fact that when we look shocked and like, how could you get women voting for Trump after he's you know, talked about grabbing them by their genitalia? And she says something that I think is really important. She says, because we think of them as female voters first, and we should not. Their best interests are as in white people. Their number one interest is in their whiteness. And so they're not voting as women. They're voting as white women. And that caveat is really, really important. And she talks about how white women joined the Ku Klux Klan, just like their male counterparts, how white women were responsible you know, for the violence that we see at the integration of schools. It's white women that don't want their children going to school with black children or white women that are responsible for calling rape and having black men be lynched, like that they are part of this narrative and story and we should not separate them out as though they don't have power. So lastly, I will leave on a positive note <laughs> by talking about how power in the hands of black women and women of color look vastly different. That when we talk about, you know, someone like Shirley Chisholm and the work that she does as the first black congresswoman, you know, it's inspirational because she says, I don't want to just be a black woman president or candidate for president. I want to be the candidate for all people. And we see that when we put women in color of power, that they're able to make changes and be so inclusive in ways that, you know, these are all women who are elected officials in our House of Representatives and in our Senate right now. And it makes me so proud to be able to see how we can have so many different hues of people, you know, changing and having an impact on our on our political outcomes and, and opportunities in ways that the original suffrages would have never imagined them. Like they could not imagine the vote, let alone 
Black women elected officials um, from all across the spectrum. And that to me is really encouraging. Uh, so I'm going to fast forward to get to uh, my last slides because of lack of time. I just think it's interesting if you think about all the senators that have been elected, we've only had 10 that have been African Americans. Uh, I ask if this is progress. I think a lot of times we think progress is like um, the exception. Progress is not the exception. Progress is the rule. So the exception is one black president, possibly one black vice president, but a rule is like, you know, 45 of them, right? Like that's, that's rule. That's, that's change. That's progress. Not one, but multiple. So I will leave it at that. I know I just, I went way over guys, <laughs> but we've got 10 minutes um, for questions. I post some questions myself, but I really do um, want to hear from you guys. I want to know what you think about um, the current moment that we're in and if there's any new information that's been presented to you and we'll go from there. I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my screen too. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, and it really, for me, it really highlights the, the hard work and the activism that, um, that Black women have done over the decades. Um, everything is a fight. And it's, it's still a fight. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and that actually leads me to my first question, which is, um, I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the organization Fair Fight and how Stacey Abrams is sort of mm. emblematic of the way Black women have long fought for rights um, in this country. Yeah, I mean, Stacey Abrams is like... You know, you can a uh, hundred years from now, I think you will put her in the same category as you do, like a, a Fannie Lou Hamer or Ida B. Wells or any of these other Black women that I talked about before. Um, that even though you know she had an unsuccessful bid for the governorship of Georgia, um, we know that voter suppression played a huge role in her loss. And so the fact that she has now said, listen, voter suppression is my number one campaign. Like this is not about, you know, gaining an office, but this is about making sure that it, everyone has the opportunity to be able to vote. Um, it's so important, especially because we've seen, you know, and this goes back to the Supreme Court and just makes me think of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but just like how the Voting Rights Act was essentially gutted in like 2013. They stripped a lot of the protections. And so um, when we start seeing states that are putting forth ID laws, um, you know, and knowing how difficult it is for certain people to get ID laws or have to pay for that ID, um, we may not think $30 is a lot, but for some people, $30 is a significant amount of money. And again, it poses the question, how much would you pay to vote, right? How much would you pay to have your voice um, you know, heard and matter. So I think what Stacey's doing is, is Abrams is doing is amazing. Um, and I really hope it makes an impact in, in this current election. I will say that regardless of, of where you stand on, on the election, I think that, and I, I read this in a tweet, I can't remember who said it, but they were like, the difference between Trump winning or losing is not the popular election, it's voter suppression. So it's not who voted, but it's who couldn't vote or didn't vote, that will determine who wins this election. That's, that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, that is, it is, it really is, it really is. Yeah. Um, so you did, you did mention um, uh, voter ID requirements as mm -hmm. one um, means to suppress the vote. We have a question here um, about what other types of voter suppression is, yeah. is still going on. Uh, can oh, you talk about that? Man. So this is the thing, guys, like coronavirus has thrown everything into, you know, disarray because now, you know, I mean, it's great that a lot of states have voting. Uh, you can vote early. I can't remember how early you can vote in Massachusetts, but it's at least... I don't know if they've opened the polls yet. Some states have already opened the polls. You can already vote for the November election. Um, but it's it's really difficult because like in places like Kentucky, they have like shut down all po polling places so that people will have to go to a, a like a like a 
a Superdome or an arena to vote, which is really troubling because again, not just think about how much you, would you pay to vote, but how would you wait? How long would you wait in line to vote? Would you wait a day? Would you wait six hours? We don't want to wait like 10 minutes for our fast food. So like, um, so I'm really concerned that part of the suppression will be closing down polling places, will be making incredibly long lines. You know, if you think it's not just a line, it's a social distance line. So that makes the lines, you know, even, even longer. If you think about the fact that most pollsters are senior citizens. So that when you when you go to vote, the person who gives you your ballot and tells you where to go, I've, I've never voted in any election. I've voted in every election, but never voted in any election where the pollster was not a senior citizen that gave me my ballot and you yeah. know, told me where to go. Um, so I'm really hoping that young people will pick up the torch and that they will get involved and that they will you know, stand in the place where senior citizens can't because I would hate to put them at risk. There's a lot on the line and it's it's not just about um, ID laws now, it's about you know, mail-in ballots and it's about closing polling places and it's about getting pollsters who can who can do the work. So it's it's a lot. I'm actually terrified Loki. <laughs> like and I'm trying I'm trying to be very optimistic because I do feel like there's a momentum in which people want to see change. But you know, it's work. It, like like we said, it, you gotta do the work. You know, we can't hope that someone will show up and do it for us. Yeah, it's constant work. Yeah, yeah, constant. Yeah. So uh, a, a couple comments. Um, apparently, early voting starts um, October seventeenth in Massachusetts. Okay, okay great. That's good. Through um, October thirtieth. Um, and someone else mentioned that another voter suppression tactic is um, the federal government. Um, threatening the post office and the, the current oh, cutback So like it's like holding it's ballots like, hostage. I mean exactly. It's bad. It's really and even I will say um criminalization. I mean if you have a felon um a felony on your record in a lot of states you can't vote. Florida surprisingly is changing that law, but I'm not sure when it will go into effect. Right. But actually in Florida even though you can't be denied your vote, even though you've been a felon, you do still have to pay all your fines. Oh yeah, that was the other part of it. It's a poll tax. It's a poll tax. Um, a poll and tax. some of these fines are thousands. That are exempted. You're like, like if you commit murder, you're still not gonna be able to vote. Oh, okay. I didn't know that, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to read these uh, comments. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm looking for a question. Uh, so one question that I have is, um, do you, if you could talk about how do we break the cycle of voter suppression, um, mm -hmm. which to be honest is mostly in the Southern states or states that are controlled by Republican legislators. That's very true. Um, I mean, if you think about the fact that there are three states, I think it's, and don't quote me on this, but it might be like Vermont, Maine, or New Hampshire, or Oregon or something. They're like the three states that that allow felons to be able to vote are like the whitest states. <laughs> so it's like in places where, you know, almost 2 million Black people are incarcerated. Um, and those votes, uh, those votes are votes that could count, that could, that could have a tremendous outcome. Um, so I do think working, you know, with activists as much as we can to get some of these laws changed is huge. Pushing back on voter IDs is huge. Voting early, I think is gonna matter a lot as soon as you can get your, your ballot in. And then getting everyone you know registered to vote. Like, um, I really wish that we would change the laws. They did this in Portland, Oregon, where they basically said, no, you're already opted in. Like you're already registered to vote. Matter of fact, you have to opt out in order in order to not be registered because it, it moves, um, it removes the, the barrier of entry order to being able to vote, to say, no, 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 you're registered already. Um, because a lot of people will show up to vote and not realize, no, you have to be registered. Um, 
And then there's, I mean, you can't just register like the day, the day of the election. So it's complicated. Getting education out there is so important and letting people know what is required to vote and what's being taken from you and where is your polling place and how far it is away. And can we make this a national election holiday so that people don't have to worry about taking off to vote or losing hours on their job or not having childcare? Like there's so many things that should go into it that to be honest, are just basic tenets of democracy, you know, like the ability to be able to vote. Um, there shouldn't be restrictions on that. And I think it's, I think Australia might be one of the countries where you actually have a tax. If you don't vote, you pay a tax. Yeah, <laughs> so that's right. Really high that's right. turnout, extremely high. Voting is compulsory in Australia. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But Australia is almost, you know, Australia is very white. So I think there's a different dynamic there too. Right. Right. Well, I think um, it is eight o'clock. Um, oh, I think gosh, I flew great, by. <laughs> yeah, I think we're ending on a great call to action, though. Register to vote. Yeah. Vote early. Come up yeah. with a plan to vote. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, get out it's there and so fight the good fight. We have to. I just, you know, I I remember someone saying last election, like, you know. Uh, for people that were upset over Trump's vote, and they were saying, if you didn't vote, you voted for Trump. If you wrote in someone else's name, you voted for Trump. Like, if, if you did not vote for the, for the Democratic game, you voted for Trump. And so, like, you can vote by not voting. That's still, you know, in some ways, it's a vote. So we have to get as many people to the polls as possible. So tell your neighbors, tell your friends, get involved, find out how you can be a poster. If you're in good health and you're not high risk, find out how you can be a poster and, and you know, take up some of the slack for our for our senior citizens who are doing the work too. That's, that's great. That's a great call to action. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you everyone who joined us. Um, I think we all enjoyed it very much. Great, uh, have a good evening. I, I hope to connect with you guys again soon. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Good night.